Hey folks, um, so for this week we're doing uh, Hannah Arendt, specifically we're reading her work on uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. So Hannah Arendt, born in 1906, uh, died in 1975. Um, she was a German Jewish philosopher, um, studied with Karl Jaspers, got her doctorate in philosophy in 1929. Um, so as, as a philosopher, you know, uh, she was very much a thinker of her times, um, and, and was sort of, uh, wrote about things that were going on, um, specifically, uh, you know, when you're a young Jewish person, uh, living in the time where, where fascism is coming to power, um, after she got her, her doctorate in 1929, uh, she was arrested by the Gestapo in 1933 um, in Berlin, I believe. Uh, because, um, you know, she also took part in journalistic endeavors. And, uh, you know, she was arrested because um, she was doing research on uh, the Nazi party and their use of anti-Semitic propaganda. Um, so of course, once she was released, she fled to Germany and, uh, ended up in Paris, but, you know, it wasn't more than, you know, it was less than a decade later that she once again had to flee, uh, France because the, the Germans invaded in 1940 and, um, eventually she came to the United States and lived in New York in 1941, um, and lived in the United States for a very long time as, uh, you know, a stateless, undocumented refugee. Um, it was 13 years before she was uh, officially given U.S. citizenship in 1950. So perhaps it doesn't come as much of a surprise that the main themes of her work um, have to do with her experience of the, you know, the life that she lived. Um, you know, she writes about power, totalitarianism, authority, evil, and, you know, the hopes for the possibility of democracy. Um, you know, she, she writes about things. Um, how do you put it? I mean, she's more interested in sort of analyzing things than she is in sort of uh, abstract theoretical frameworks, I suppose you could say. But um, if there is a kind of core to her work. Um, she does seem to advocate a, a certain type of civic republicanism or, or participatory democracy, right? And the kind of like classical Republican thought, like, like Thomas Paine or Du Bois, uh, perhaps. But the work that we're reading this week, um, you know, it, it's not a, a work of philosophy in the traditional sense. Um, you know, Arendt does have uh, a number of texts like that, uh, notably the origins of totalitarianism and the human condition. Whereas um, Eichmann, Eichmann in Jerusalem was assembled from a series of articles um, that she wrote for the New Yorker during the trial trial of Adolf Eichmann um, back in 1961. So quite a lot of this book uh, that our our reading was taken from. Um, Involves accounts of, of courtroom proceedings, but uh, she does a lot of editorializing as well. And um, in the course of writing about this trial, and specifically to sort of describe the figure of Adolf Eichmann, she develops this notion um, called the banality of evil, right? So this Adolf Eichmann guy that we're talking about, he was a uh, high-ranking member of the Nazi party. Um, who played a, a major role in um, what is often called the final solution, right? Um, that is the the Nazi Party position, or, or the moment when they sort of officially made the decision to uh, turn the concentration camps um, specifically into death camps, right? Um, so that's kind of this guy's claim to fame, uh, or claim to infamy. 
after the war, he escaped Germany um, and fled to Argentina, but was um, later captured by Mossad uh, in 1960, I think. Um, so, right, decades, decades after the war had ended, uh, decades after the Nuremberg trials had taken place, um, so he was sort of he was found by uh, Israeli intelligence forces, and uh, brought back to Israel to stand trial. Right, and he was indicted with crimes against humanity, um, and you know for the fact that he he bears uh, or bore direct responsibility not just for the war but for really the the most inhumane horizons of the war, namely the the Holocaust itself. So we turn to this concept of the banality of evil, right? And this is already tricky, right? Because it, it has a stake in, um, it makes a claim about evil, which is, uh, I, you know, it's a tough thing to define, right? Like, what is evil? Um, and that's, you know, Arendt isn't uh, going to give us much help in, in that respect, right? Um nor is that her uh, intention. Right, when we talk about evil, I, you know, a way to put it might be that um, evil is something hard to define, but not terribly hard to ascribe. Uh, said otherwise, right, it's hard to explain in the abstract what evil is. Um, but it's not terribly difficult to, like, when you see something happening, go, oh, well, that that's evil right it's it's easier to ascribe to a situation to an action to a person um to an event than it is to sort of define in the abstract right but i submit that we uh usually associate evil with inhuman actions right that um actions that might cause suffering or harm um right, especially when that harm you know, is inflicted arbitrarily, right? So I don't know. We might disagree about that definition. Um, but the question when it comes to the banality of evil is uh, how is this notion of evil modified by the concept of banality, right? Because those things uh, don't really go together, right? Or they don't intuitively go together, right? where banality um, <clears throat> usually just means that uh, it refers to something boring, right? Unoriginal, everyday, common, right? Uh, and, you know, evil can be many things, but uh, evil isn't usually boring, right? I mean, when we think about evils... We tend to think of these, you know, uh, you know, magnificent events that involve like uh, violence and, and drama, and you know, we we tend to think of evil things as being fairly catastrophic, right? Um, so that's why it's going to be important to think about uh, what this concept of banality is doing when we talk about the banality of evil, and when Arendt talks about the banality of evil. And, you know, put simply, I think she, well, she's using that to refer to the way that evil can sort of become sewn into the fabric of everyday life, right? The way in which um, inhuman acts uh, can become sort of institutionalized or ritualized or, or routine or just sort of, um, you know, common everyday occurrences. Said otherwise, they become normal. Right, um, it, it becomes uh, clear that you know humans. Um, well, are capable of doing some pretty nasty things when those nasty things become, um, in some sort of putative sense, normal, right? And, you know, these things are, are usually much easier to see in the rearview mirror, right? When we look back in history at certain practices or beliefs that people held um, that seem terrible to us now. You know, we look back um, 
you know, you, you know, take your pick. History is full of it. But, you know, look back on something and go like, oh my god, how could they have uh, thought that way? Or how could they have done these things? How could, um, you know, these terrible things have been so, so every day? Um, you know, we might have a hard time imagining how, how these things would have seemed normal to people. Um, so the banality of evil is sneaky, right? And so it's one of those concepts that's also worth thinking about, um, you know, what sort of things do we say and do today uh, that for future generations are they going to look back on us and be like, well, how did they ever, you know? I mean, if you want to give a generous description of the banality of evil, um, you might think that it's, you know, humans are, are, are highly adaptive animals, right? We, we tend to um, adapt to different circumstances fairly quickly, and, and that can be a virtue, of course, right? And that's part of um, what makes humans cool is that, you know, there, there isn't just sort of one universal form of life that we all sort of, uh, you know, naturally inherit. You know, we can we can find ourselves um, in a lot of different um, existential niches. Um, but there's a danger in that too, right? Um, in the sense that it becomes sort of, to the extent that we're also quite adaptive, uh, you can see how that also leads to a sense in which it makes it easier for the banality of evil to sort of like slip into our world in ways that we become used to, right? Um, and of course, it's much easier to justify these banal tasks when um, they appear to us in the form of, you know, just part of the cultural practices that we're situated in, or if that's just part of your job. Right or or if you're just following orders, um, especially in the case of Eichmann here, right? So you can already see how we can make some interesting connections to the notion of bad faith. So the interesting, I mean, interesting is probably the wrong word. Adolf Eichmann was was a uh, standing trial, and. Um, you know, he alleged, like, look, I, I'm being brought up for these, like, crimes against humanity here, but I never actually killed anyone, right? Or not in the narrowest sense, right? Like, he never pulled a trigger, right? He never choked somebody out. But also, in some very real sense, he also killed 12 million people. Um, but his allegation was like, look, I, I was just sort of um, a bureaucrat. Right? I was an administrator. I'm not a soldier. Right? I, I didn't do the dirty work. I didn't kill people. Um, so the guy pled for his innocence in this trial. Right? Um, specifically insofar as he believed, like, look, I'm, I'm not one of the guys you want. Right? I'm not one of the people um, that's responsible for this. I was just following orders. Um... And part of why Arendt is sort of um, invoking this concept of the banality of evil and sort of coming up with this term um, is specifically to describe the way in which he didn't appear to show any signs of, of guilt or um, feelings of remorse. And that's exactly what we have to look into here. Because, I mean... The guy spent nine months in a jail cell in Jerusalem and was given sort of these daily interrogations, and, and they got um, hundreds of hours of recordings and, and you know thousands of pages of transcript um, for the trial because he told them everything, right? He, uh, you know, he was not coy about it because, um, I mean, to understand Eichmann you have to understand that he actually believed he was innocent, right? One of the guys who helped organize the final solution really believed that he was innocent, right? And was, for that reason, very cooperative. Um, because he really believed that the truth was on his side, 
and he believed that if he thought if he could explain um this to people the you know the court would understand right if they could see it from his perspective they would also understand oh he's not actually really responsible for this um he was just doing his job i mean of course the, you know they didn't see his side of the story nor should you um you know he was found guilty on all charges and executed in 1962 um but one of the interesting things about this guy is he made sure to mention as often as he could that um he wasn't anti-semitic right he he just said like i have no problem with jewish people right um and he really thought that this detail was going to play in his favor Right? He thought that that was going to uh, convince people that, oh, he's not responsible because he didn't do it. Like, he did these terrible things, but he was just doing his job. He didn't do it uh, with real, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see it right now, like real hatred in his heart, right? Um, I mean, his claim is uh, that he was obedient. Right? And and that he was, um, and this was a virtue of his, which was abused by his Nazi superiors, right? And was painting himself out to be a victim here, or was making himself out to be a victim, right? Um, he was sort of saying, like, look, I, you know, it, it was my sort of, um, strong sense of obedience that allowed them to take advantage of me. And allowed them to get me to go along with these things. Um, and, you know, now here I am uh, standing trial for them, but I'm, I'm not really the one you want, right? Because it wasn't my idea, really. I was following orders, right? Um, and the people you want are, are the ones who are really guilty, right? Uh, the people who did these things, not somebody like me who's just a bureaucrat. Or an administrator. Involved, right? But not responsible. In fact, you know, he really... Uh, this guy's a piece of work, right? I mean, because he also makes sure to mention during this trial that... Um, look, I was a really good Nazi, right? I was really good at my job. And if my talents had been properly recognized, um, then maybe I, I would have been more highly promoted. And if I was promoted higher, as I should have been, then maybe none of this would have happened in the first place. Like, almost saying that, like, you're lucky you had somebody like me on the inside, right? Like, I was, um... I mean, imagine bragging about being a good Nazi when you're on trial for war crimes, right? Um... I mean, right up until the end of the trial... He was really convinced, like, look, I'm, I'm not a monster. Um, I, I was just doing my job. And what's happening here is I'm suffering for the acts of others. And the thing is, it, you know, you can't understand Eichmann if you think he's just a sociopath. Right, like it is true. I mean, it's heartbreakingly true that he's not a monster. Um, that there's nothing especially abnormal about Eichmann. I mean, yeah, maybe he's he's a little too. Um, right, this is not to say that um, he's innocent. Right, it's just to say that uh, there's something kind of all too human about this scenario, right? And to say that he's not a monster doesn't support the idea that, you know, the trial should have gone a different way and he should have been found innocent, right? Rather, it's... When you look at the figure of Eichmann and Arendt's depiction of Eichmann, you can see how the banality of evil thrives in bad faith, Right? I mean, Eichmann was using precisely those strategies of bad faith that Beauvoir was talking about. I mean, he's saying that he's not responsible for the things that he was participating in, right? It wasn't really him 
that was doing it. It was my superiors. It was, you know, the organization I was part of. It was, you know, uh, just something I had to do to try to get a promotion, right? It was just my job. Right? He's got all these different ways of disavowing his responsibility. And he really believes them. Right? I mean, uh, you can sort of see this in... I mean, this is the part that fascinated Arendt about uh, Eichmann's trial. Is that... You know, these don't appear to be ad hoc ways of justifying his behavior, right? These aren't stories that he's telling because now he got caught. Rather, these stories that he's telling explain how he was able to participate in these things in the first place, right? I mean, the story that he's telling and the reason why... um, Arendt is, is sort of so fascinated with this case, is that um, these same justifications uh, also serve to explain how millions of people, millions of other people, were complicit in the fascist experience as well, right? I mean, Eichmann isn't the only one who was sort of caught in the clutches of the banality of evil. And in fact, it's something, you know, quite common. Um, not always quite as sort of, doesn't always appear as vividly as it does in the Eichmann trial, right? And and certainly these uh, people participating in the banality of evil are rarely so candid about um, their behavior, right? But in many ways, Eichmann was a serious man, right? He was a serious bureaucrat. And um, really expects us, right, believes that that's true and that's going to save him. That that's going to ameliorate his responsibility for being a Nazi. And that's why he's so candid is because he expects us, uh, you know, the sort of royal us, the the courtroom, to... um, Like, he thinks if he can just explain to us the mechanisms of bad faith that he was using for uh, justifying being a Nazi, then we're going to get it, right? And we're going to be on his side. And we're going to understand, oh, right, you weren't doing this because you're evil. You were just doing your job. So you're not really responsible. Of course, that's not how responsibility works, right? So that does a lot to set up the scene here. Um, We'll be going a bit more into the text next lecture, and um, we'll also be discussing uh, guilt and the way that that is a role in the banality of evil.